In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today does continue the series that we began in the book of Daniel. And just to give you a little bit of background or refresher on what's happening, King Belshazzar has held a great feast and he ordered all the vessels that had been obtained by his father when he raided the temples in Jerusalem. In other words, God's temple that he had raided, all of the vessels that were supposed to be used in the worship of God, he now calls them out to be used to serve drinks for him and his guest. And so there's no respect whatsoever for the sanctity of these items. And he's specifically kind of, I don't even know if he's doing it intentionally, but he's certainly being flippant and apathetic about God. And he's kind of, you know, putting a middle finger up to God and saying that I, I can use these things for my own benefit. And then we see a hand write a message on a wall. And he doesn't understand what's going on there. He doesn't understand what the message says. Nobody can interpret it. He calls in his magicians. They don't know what it says. And the queen remembers something. She says, there was this guy that back when your father was king, he always used to handle all the interpretations of dreams and all these mysteries that nobody else could understand. Somehow he always got them. And so King Belshazzar says, all right, bring him in. And Daniel looks at the... Uh, the writing in Belshazzar says, I will give you all of these wonderful things and all this power and prestige if you'll just read this translation and interpret it from me. And Daniel says, ah, don't worry about that. You can give the rewards to somebody else or keep them for yourself. But you asked me to do it and you are the king, so I'll go ahead and, and make the interpretation known to you. And we really see the follow-up of that and we see the results of that in this next passage in Daniel chapter 5 verses 25 through 28. Now this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharison. Uh, up this is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has been numbered, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Looking at what's about to happen, and of course we do know from hindsight that that is exactly what happens. In fact, if you were to look a little further down into that passage, you would see that that very night, the night that Daniel makes this translation known to the king, that the king is slaughtered, and King Darius, who is a Mede, takes his place and takes over his empire. So it didn't take very long for this prophecy to be fulfilled. But I want you to notice something in that writing. God very clearly sets out a cause and effect relationship between the king's behavior and what happens to him in life. And so, because he establishes this, and it's something that ought to be easy for Christians to understand, he's saying, you didn't humble yourself like your father did. Your father was raised up in pride and, and wound up living amongst the beast. And you're doing the same thing despite seeing this, despite seeing his example, despite seeing what happens when you defy God. You chose to do it anyway. You chose to just ignore that and to do what you wanted to. And because of that, this is the verdict that God has written on the wall for him to understand. So God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. In other words, God is looking at your kingdom your days are numbered, and God is going to put an end to the Babylonian Empire to make way for the Medes and the Persians. And then the second part of that, which is, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Because he had been given every opportunity to not live out the example of his father, to follow God and to devote himself to the one true God of the universe. 
He had that ability. He had that option. He chose to ignore it. And because of that, God weighed him on the scales, and he was found not worthy. That ought to be a terrifying verse to all of us. Because we all know that eventually we are going to face a similar judgment. That God is going to set us upon the scales of his judgment. And we may be found efficient. And the only way to be found efficient, in other words, the only way to be placed on the scales of justice as a flawed human being and to be found worthy to be in God's sight and to be in his presence and to enter into his kingdom is if God's not seeing us. Is if what's really happening here is that when God makes that judgment, we have been washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. That's the only way that we're going to be placed on the scales of judgment and not be found deficient, is that what's actually being weighed is Christ's love for us, not what we've done in this life. But God here is saying that when it comes to this guy, his actions are not worthy of mercy. His actions have not proven himself worthy. He has been found deficient in the way that he lived his life. And so there's a very clear, like I said, cause and effect relationship here. Because he has been found deficient, this is what God is going to do. And this is something that is really common in the biblical narrative. We don't really see God in the way that a lot of atheists would like to think of him. In other words, God just thumping people because he doesn't like them. That doesn't really happen. What does happen a lot is that God either punishes someone directly because of actions that they have done, or he kind of steps back and allows them to fall victim of their own circumstances. For example, I don't know that God is specifically moving the Medes and the Persians to come in and to take the kingdom away from King Belshazzar. But it may be that God is just not going to protect him because of what he's done, and because of that, these guys are going to come in, and because of bad decisions that Belshazzar made, he is going to fall victim of his own incompetence, his own inadequacy as a human being. And that seems to be what is actually going to happen here. But I want you to notice the progression and how we got to this point. God gave him a warning and gave him ample time to change. He gave him a warning in the, the form of his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, that he saw what God did to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar had lifted up his heart in pride and arrogance and refused to humble himself. And even though Belshazzar saw that, he still ignored the warning signs. And so God gave him plenty of opportunity. But let's also ask this question. Why did he put the writing on the wall? What was the purpose of that? It doesn't seem to be something that helps Daniel because even though Daniel may not have known it immediately and when it was going to happen and known all the details at the time, Daniel's about to be under a completely different administration. King Belshazzar is not going to be around anymore. So we can't really say that this was something kind of like the dream interpretation that God allowed Daniel to do to help Daniel improve his status. We can't really say that because that very night the only people that would have seen him do this are no longer going to be in power. And so I contend, and I think that this is a fair assumption, and it is an assumption. I don't have any scripture to specifically back this up. But I think what's going on here is God is giving Belshazzar one last chance. He is performing this miracle in hopes that Belshazzar is going to see this, and Belshazzar is going to say, Oh man, I really did mess up here. I didn't listen to God's warning at all. I really need to turn my life around and fix this. But he doesn't do it. There is no indication in the scripture that Belshazzar took this seriously and even after having seen this miracle, turned his life around and apologized to God and repented of his sins. And who knows, maybe if he had done that, his life would have been spared or he would have had some kind of reward in the afterlife. But we're given no indication at all that Belshazzar even felt a hint of remorse after hearing God that he had been found unworthy on the scales of justice. And that really is a sad existence to have.
there is no indication whatsoever that he repented of his sins. And if that should be a lesson to us in any way, we should remember this. God gives people chances. Don't let them pass by. Stay the course, friends. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.